I'm very pleased to introduce Georgia Ede again, a psychiatrist um, from the US who has done a lot of this, written a book. So Georgia, inform us please. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning. Uh, nice to be back with all of you again today. Uh, so there have been some really interesting presentations and discussions about how diet affects physical and mental health over the past couple of days. Uh, we have considered some very important questions, things like how much carbohydrate should we eat? How much fat should we eat? How many calories should we eat? How often should we eat? What things should we not eat? But one of the things that we really haven't talked very much about at all is what should we eat? Uh, how do foods, the individual food choices that we make within our preferred dietary patterns, how do those affect our risk for future mental health conditions and the course of any existing mental health conditions we may already have? So, um, and this was, you know, food actually, uh, the brain actually cares a lot about your food choices. Uh, and that's not something I, that I would have thought about when I was in medical school or residency. As I think most women do, I thought really of my food choices as purely a way of controlling my weight. Uh, and, and it wasn't brought up in, in medical school or residency, this relationship. Uh, but of course, food does matter to the brain. Uh, uh, we were taught um, the, what's called the biopsychosocial model of causes, root causes of mental illness, meaning that mental illnesses are thought to have uh, psychosocial causes, uh, such as stress, trauma, of course your mother, um, and those kinds of stresses we were taught to address with psychotherapy. And we were taught that the, bio the biological root causes of mental illnesses were largely neurotransmitter imbalances, chemical imbalances in the brain. This is a theory that's been uh, dominant for the past 75 years and really the biological uh, uh, track in psychiatry has, has changed very, very little over that period of time. Now, it's not that uh, neurotransmitter imbalances don't matter, they do, uh, and it's not that the medications that address these neurotransmitter imbalances can't help sometimes, they certainly can help sometimes, it's just that they don't, they really fail most people. Um, <clears throat> they do help some people, <clears throat> excuse me, they do help some people, but the price that people pay for the relief that they will sometimes get from these medications is often a, a lot of uh, um, physical health, especially metabolic health disturbances. For example, um, within minutes to hours of the first dose of taking an antipsychotic medication, blood sugar and insulin levels can begin to rise. So there are a lot of trade-offs here. So, and this is very interesting because I've been thinking about this week, when it comes to the, the, the conferences, we've, we've talked a lot about obesity and type 2 diabetes, and uh, we actually have, uh, for better or for worse, we have some medications that can help us with obesity and type 2 diabetes. They actually work, and uh, if you can access them and tolerate them, we really don't have, for most people, uh, any good medication solutions for mental illnesses. And this makes nutrition, uh, prioritizing good nutrition and finding alternative solutions uh, all the more important. So medications are important. I still use them in my practice, even though I'm a nutritional and metabolic psychiatrist, they have a, a really important place to play, to play uh, or a, a role to play. But uh, you know, I've become convinced uh, very strongly that the most powerful way to change brain chemistry is through food, because that's where the brain chemicals come from in the first place. And I think all of us would agree that food must play some role. Uh, we may also uh, agree that this so-called SAD diet, the sand, standard American diet, which is very high in ultra-processed foods, is probably not very good for the brain. It's certainly hazardous for the rest of the body. Why should the brain be any different? But I think where we might uh, come to some uh, heated disagreements and uh, passionate discussion is, uh, what should we eat instead of the standard American diet? Which dietary changes are most worth making and why? There's no consensus around that question. We have lots of opinions. We have, uh, um, so for example, there are two uh, relatively new uh, uh, subspecialties within the field of psychiatry. In the past 10 years or so, the field of modern nutritional psychiatry, uh, nutritional psychiatry is a, a, um, a field established, uh, the, this term was coined by uh, Dr. Felice Jacka, a nutritional psych psychology researcher at the uh, Deakin University in Australia. 
And the, the thought leaders, most of the thought leaders in the field of nutritional psychiatry um, uh, recommend the Mediterranean diet over the standard American diet. Uh, now, I consider myself a nutritional psychiatrist because nutritional psychiatrists believe that uh, the, uh, the decline in uh, our global mental health is largely related to the decline in the, deter the, the, decline in the quality of the modern diet. So I absolutely 100% agree with that. So uh, nutritional psychiatrists, for the most part, uh, focus on the Mediterranean diet, and with good reason. There is actually excellent data on the Mediterranean diet, particularly for clinical depression. There are several randomized controlled trials now showing that if you switch from a standard American diet to the Mediterranean diet, you can significantly improve uh, symptoms of depression. But just because the Mediterranean diet is better than the standard American diet for the brain does not necessarily mean that it's the best diet for the brain. And there, is, uh, there are several reasons uh, to, to think that it may not be. Now, there's an even newer branch of uh, psychiatry uh, called metabolic psychiatry, and this was a, a term coined by Dr. Shabani Sethi, who's here this week from Stanford. Uh, metabolic psychiatrists are interested uh, less in the nutritional quality of the diet and more in the metabolic quality of the diet. Meaning that we are, and I also consider myself a metabolic psychiatrist, we are interested in the metabolic roots of mental illness. Uh, in other words, how does, uh, how does the diet that people are eating provide the brain with energy? Uh, because, and, and, and we are primarily interested in the ketogenic diet because it energizes the brain so differently from every other diet. And somehow we've gotten away, I don't know how, how this happened, we've escaped uh, defining what a ketogenic diet is. It's already Wednesday, <laughs> conference is almost over. Uh, but uh, let me just rectify that. So uh, I think a, a good definition is any way of eating uh, that lowers insulin levels enough to turn on fat burning and generate clinically meaningful levels of ketones in the blood. And most people would say that that begins at around uh, 0.5 millimole beta hydroxy beta-hydroxybutyrate. Now, it doesn't have to be a low-carb diet. Uh, you can get intermittently into ketosis using intermittent fasting. You can uh, get into ketosis using a very low-calorie diet, even if it's high in carbohydrate. Uh, but a, a ketogenic diet allows you to stay in ketosis without fasting and without uh, cal caloric restriction. So typically, it is very low in carbohydrate, uh, moderate in protein, not excessive in protein, uh, and uh, obtains most of its uh, calories from fat as opposed to carbohydrate. So these are two very different diets. And I, and I hope that if you were here on Monday, you were, you were convinced or at least intrigued by the, the, what I think is the remarkable therapeutic potential of the ketogenic diet to improve uh, even quite serious mental illnesses. So how can both of these two very different diets, one which is based in carbohydrate starches and grains, and the other, which contains almost no carbohydrate at all, how can both of those diets be good for the brain? And is one of them better than the other? I mean, patients are very, very confused about this. So I think that whenever we're thinking about any diet, uh, I mean, there are lots of other dietary patterns we could talk about, you know, low fat and vegan, other kinds of diets. How do we know which one is best for the brain? And I think the only way we can really even begin to think about this question is to take a step back and instead of you know, asking you know, what your favorite diet, how, how your favorite diet, whether it's the best for the brain, is to ask, what does a brain-healthy diet need to accomplish? And that way we can establish some, maybe some uh, logical criteria by which we could then uh, you know, compare our favorite diets to, kind of as a, as a yardstick, as an objective yardstick. So I hope these won't be too, uh, uh, I, th I hope that we can gather some consensus around these. Uh, I don't think there's a controversial. A brain-healthy diet should nourish the brain. It should provide the brain with all essential nutrients. It should protect the brain by excluding any ingredients that we are fairly certain damage the brain. And it should energize the brain in ways that support healthy brain metabolism over the lifespan. So um, I, th I think uh, those, are, those are fairly, not, should be non-controversial. Uh, so, when, whenever we're making any food choice within whatever dietary pattern you wish, we could be asking ourselves this question, how does this food nourish, protect, and energize my brain? Is this doing anything for me, or is this mostly doing something against me? Uh, and so, which foods are best at nourishing the brain? 
Now, whole foods are certainly better at nourishing the brain than other foods, but not all whole foods are created equal. And it is, just, it, it is inescapable, this truth, this biological truth, that if you are trying to nourish your brain entirely with plant foods, not with supplements or ultra-processed foods that have been fortified, you, you, you cannot do this without including some animal food in your diet. It's, it's just a fact, a biological fact. Uh, this, um, uh, this slide uh, shows you the nutrient deficiencies uh, for which uh, people who are choosing a vegan diet uh, this, the, this, uh, were deficient in, uh, more likely to be deficient in than people who are eating other diets. This was a study just published in uh, 2022, conducted in the Netherlands, a very uh, nicely written study. So these are you know, nutrients like vitamin B12, iron, zinc, iodine, omega-3 fatty acids, all of those nutrients are much more difficult, if not impossible, to obtain from plant foods uh, and, uh, and are, are very easy to obtain from animal foods. So I want to give an example of why even if a plant food contains a nutrient that you might not be able to access it, and this is a little known nutrition secret. Uh, so for example, the grains and legumes that form the, the foundation of the Mediterranean diet are actually extraordinarily poor sources of micronutrients uh, and they also contain anti-nutrients. And so there are a variety of these listed here. We're just going to focus on one for the sake of example, which is phytic acid. Uh, phytic acid exists in all grains, beans, nuts, and seeds. And it's a powerful mineral magnet designed to hold onto the mineral for the sake of the sprouting plant. It certainly does not want you to, uh, to, to, uh, obtain, to access its minerals. So phytic acid interferes with our ability to absorb uh, iron, calcium, magnesium, and zinc. Uh, and I, I use this slide in many presentations, forgive me if you've already seen it, but it's just a helpful uh, example. So oysters are the, uh, the, food, the whole food uh, that is richest in zinc uh, in the world. So if you eat oysters, your zinc level will rise very nicely in the blood. If you eat that, th those oysters with uh, black beans, then you will absorb less than half of the zinc from those oysters. If you eat those oysters with corn tortillas, you absorb virtually none of the zinc from those oysters. This is not a subtle effect. And minerals are very important for the brain. Um, you know, it, for many, many, uh, many uh, functions in the brain, including uh, affecting our neurotransmitter systems, which drugs are trying to help us improve the function of. Excuse me. So uh, iron is a lovely example, too, because you know, we take for granted that 20% of women around the world are iron deficient. This is just really absurd that we would accept this. Because if you have iron deficiency, you don't just have a blood problem. You have a brain problem. And iron is required for neurotransmitter synthesis. And it is, it is uh, an essential part of the electron transport chain inside mitochondria where brain energy is generated. Not enough iron, not enough brain energy. So uh, nourishing your brain requires that you include at least some animal food in the diet. Which foods do you need to exclude to protect your brain? Uh, so of course, the ultra-processed foods, that would be a great place to start. Um, and uh, hearty congratulations to the UK, because now more than 50% of your diet is no longer food. It is now ultra-processed ingredients, um, and uh, second only to the United States, uh, where uh, it is more than 60% of our foods. And so when we're talking about what makes the standard American diet so dangerous for the body and for the brain, it's not red meat and saturated fat. Those are ancient ingredients. It's the modern ingredients that are so novel to our bodies. These started as whole foods. Uh, we're talking about refined carbohydrates and refined seed oils. These are the signature ingredients of all modern unhealthy diets. So regardless of what pattern you eat, you want to exclude refined carbohydrates and vegetable oils as much as you can. So, um, these, uh, uh, um, so even if you're eating lots of healthy whole foods throughout the week and on the weekends you take a break and you treat yourself to something ultra-processed, if you're eating too many of these ultra-processed foods, you've taken this beautiful brain that you've worked so hard to build during the week and you have dropped it into a very unhealthy environment of inflammation, <laughs> oxidative stress, and insulin resistance. These are the more recently discovered uh, drivers of all kinds of uh, neuropsychiatric conditions and, and physical conditions as well. So how do refined carbohydrates and refined seed oils lead to excessive inflammation, oxidative stress, and insulin resistance? And what are these things anyway? We've talked a lot about insulin resistance, but not so much 
uh, with respect to the brain. So inflammation and oxidation are normal part, the normal first phase of our immune system. They're healthy, normal responses to, to any threat. So if you're eating a diet that's too high in refined carbohydrates, uh, your blood sugar levels will spike too frequently and your brain sugar levels will spike too frequently as well. Uh, and uh, that excess sugar uh, in the brain's environment will literally stick to proteins and lipids and uh, nucleic acids and other cell components and create these um, crippled, dysfunctional, caramelized molecules called advanced glycation end products. And to prevent these from accumulating, the brain mounts an immune response uh, to begin to neutralize and clear away these AGEs uh, and, and, and then is supposed to return the brain, uh, is supposed to heal the brain and return it to normal. That first phase of the immune response is uh, brain cells releasing uh, inflammatory cytokines to deliberately create inflammation and uh, oxygen-free radicals to deliberately create oxidative stress. These are the important first steps of the immune response, but then they're supposed to be followed by a healing phase. Now, uh, this is supposed to be controlled, temporary, targeted, but if you are eating foods containing refined carbohydrates three, four, five, six times a day, which is not at all unusual, uh, this process never has a chance to let up. So what you've got is uncontrolled, chronic inflammation and oxidative stress. Very dangerous for the brain. We, we are only beginning to uh, understand how, um, how the toxic vegetable oils that Nina Teicholz has done such a beautiful job uncovering the dangers of uh, in her book, Big Fat Surprise, and all of her research. Um, we're only, only beginning to understand how these affect the brain. So vegetable oils are exceedingly unnaturally high in linoleic acid, a very fragile uh, uh, fatty acid, um, uh, polyunsaturated fatty acid. Um, what I understand so far about these, which I researched for the book, is that the brain absorbs linoleic acid quite well, but it really doesn't know what to do with it. it, 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 it what it does with it, unfortunately, uh, instead of turning it into you know, arachidonic acid, which is an important, uh, uh, omega, uh, important omega-6 fatty acid for the brain, or turning it into something else useful, almost all the linoleic acid absorbs, it burns for energy. That's not what you want. The brain is not supposed to burn fatty acids for energy. When it burns fatty acids for energy, it creates a lot of inflammation and oxidative stress. And the brain is much better at burning uh, glucose, ketones, and other small molecules. Uh, so how do excessive inflammation and oxidative stress, regardless of what causes them, because diet's not the only cause, you know, smoking, uh, alcohol consumption, other types of things can cause inflammation and oxidative stress. But so how do inflammation and oxidative stress contribute to mental health problems? One way is by creating neurotransmitter imbalances, the very same neuro neurotransmitter imbalances that psychiatric medications are designed to target. So this is just one prime example of this. This is a, a pathway in the brain called the kynurenine pathway. So you can see on the left, um, the molecule tryptophan, it's an amino acid, an essential amino acid from dietary protein. Normally, under normal circumstances, as you see here, we'll call this the Zen state, um, this is, uh, the tryptophan, a small amount, will go down to make uh, serotonin and melatonin, uh, important neurotransmitters, but most of it, even under normal circumstances, will go to the right, uh, down this kynurenine pathway, where it's used to regulate the balance between two other neurotransmitters, major neurotransmitters in the brain, widespread, GABA and glutamate. So you can think of GABA as sort of the brain's brake pedal and glutamate as the brain's gas pedal. Uh, GABA is the brain's primary inhibitory neurotransmitter and glutamate is the brain's primary excitatory, excitatory neurotransmitter. So the balance between these two, GABA and glutamate, at any given moment essentially determines the brain's activity level at any given point in time. Uh, so, uh, so what happens under the influence of excessive inflammation or oxidative stress is this, something called the tryptophan steel, where even less tryptophan goes down to make serotonin and melatonin, and almost all of it goes down the bottom branch of the kynurenine pathway, the neuroinflammatory pathway, uh, uh, where, so it, as a result, what you get of this shift is you get less serotonin, less melatonin, more dopamine, less GABA, and significantly more glutamate, up to 100 times baseline. 
And if this state persists or occurs too often, uh, you, it can lead to a, a, a situation called glutamate excitotoxicity. This is uh, associated with many different psychiatric conditions are known to, uh, to be associated with glutamate excitotoxicity. Glut high levels of glutamate are very dangerous for the brain. They directly physically damage proteins, lipids, nucleic, nucleic acids, which means that they can injure mitochondria, weaken the blood-brain barrier, uh, kill cells of the hippocampus and cause the hippocampus, the brain's learning and memory center, to shrink. So you do not want to spend too much time in this state of mind. So uh, how do you best energize the brain? So we, we understand that to nourish it, you, you should include some animal foods and stick primarily to whole foods uh, um, and, and reduce the, the amounts of foods that have anti-nutrients in them. We know that uh, to protect it, you want to really avoid those refined carbohydrates and seed oils. There are other things you want to do as well, but this is what we have time for today. How do you best energize the brain? It's really this simple. What you want to do is keep your blood sugar and insulin levels under good control. And so part of that, of course, is avoiding refined carbohydrates. And that there's two reasons then to do that. Um, so how does the brain uh, normally get energy? Uh, so uh, when glucose is traveling through the bloodstream, um, uh, the, the, uh, the amount of glucose inside the brain is always mirrors the amount traveling in the bloodstream. It's proportional. It's much lower inside the brain than in the blood, but it's proportional. So the higher the blood sugar, the higher the brain sugar. Um, so even people with severe insulin resistance or type 2 diabetes, which is an end-stage form of insulin resistance, never need to worry about low brain glucose. What they need to worry about, people with insulin resistance, which is now the vast majority of us, uh, is low brain insulin. Because when somebody develops insulin resistance, uh, it becomes harder and harder for insulin to cross into the brain. Glucose still waltzes in, no questions asked. But this, uh, if your insulin levels are running too high too often, the uh, insulin receptors on the blood-brain barrier become resistant to insulin, and uh, those insulin receptors are needed to escort insulin into the brain. So now you've got a problem on your hands. So this is a paradox. So the more refined carbohydrate you eat, the higher your blood sugar levels will be, uh, but uh, the higher your insulin levels will be. So high blood sugar, high brain sugar, but over time, paradoxically, the higher the blood insulin, the lower the brain insulin. This is a serious problem because the brain cannot turn glucose into energy or anything else um, efficiently to maximal capacity without adequate insulin. And that leads to a situation uh, called cerebral glucose hypometabolism, which is just a fancy expression for sluggish brain glucose processing. Uh, you're not processing glucose at full capacity if you have insulin resistance. Uh, so essentially, the brain can be swimming in a sea of glucose and still be starving to death. That is a very serious problem, and that is one of the driving forces behind Alzheimer's disease, as we heard from Dr. Stephen Cunane earlier this week. Um, and as I was explaining on Monday, uh, the, um, all of the conditions on this slide, all the psychiatric conditions on this slide, are known to be associated with insulin resistance and or cerebral gluc glucose hypometabolism. So obviously prevention is best, right? So once you have insulin resistance, especially if it's more advanced, uh, you already have some compromise in your brain's ability to use glucose for energy. So you want to prevent that situation because it's actually very difficult, if not impossible, to reverse that situation. Um, once you're in that situation, you're going to need an alternative fuel source. So prevention is best, uh, and I think we really need to expand the narrative. Uh, we think, I mean, again, was I, when I was in medical school and residency, I, I was not thinking about the health of any of my organs. I was just thinking about how to control my weight, and I think a lot of people do still. And it's, it's something people really care about. But we need to expand the narrative beyond obesity, beyond type 2 diabetes, um, to, to brain health. And you know, under, teaching people how important it is to protect their metabolic health before it's too late. Because once it's too late, you, you often have to go to some measures that you might not want to go to to uh, re-energize your brain and, and revitalize, your, um, revitalize your metabolism. So what diet is best for prevention is one question. What diet is best for treatment is another question. 
So let's take some of the principles that we are, uh, have just um, gone through today to uh, translate those into some, some basic brain food rules. Now, there are others, but we don't, they don't have time for it, but, but these are your fundamentals. To nourish your brain, you want to include some animal food in the diet. You want to avoid grains and legumes if you can. To protect the brain, you want to avoid refined carbohydrates and uh, vegetable oils and ultra-processed foods. To energize your brain, you want to avoid refined carbohydrate, and you want to uh, tailor your whole food sources of carbohydrates, by which I mean fruits and vegetables, fruits and starchy vegetables, to your personal metabolic tolerance. You may not need a ketogenic diet. You may only need to understand what your personal carbohydrate threshold is. It's a little different for everyone. So um, I'm going to come back to the Mediterranean diet because I, had, I alluded to the, the, my, I'd said something a little provocative and I want to clean it up, which is I'd said that just because the Mediterranean, Mediterranean diet is better for the brain uh, than the standard American diet, I mean, really, what diet isn't, um, uh, doesn't mean it's necessarily the best diet for the brain. Uh, so, and I said that there are some good reasons to think that it may not be. So what did I mean by that? Well, let's use our new yardstick of nourish, uh, protect, energize. How well does the Mediterranean diet nourish the brain? Uh, well, it is grounded and its foundation is nutrient-poor grains and legumes that are high in anti-nutrients. That doesn't make a lot of sense to me. I think you could choose a better foundation. How well does it protect the brain? Well, it does discourage certain types of refined carbohydrates, such as sweets, sugar, things like that, but it also explicitly encourages other types of refined grains, such as breads and pasta. So it's, it's not, it doesn't do as good a job as it could. And it explicitly encourages red wine consumption, which, as a psychiatrist, I think that's just malpractice. I, if any patient comes to me and says, oh, Dr. E, you know, I'm in a lot of trouble concentrating. My memory is not what it used to be. I'm so depressed. I'm not going to say to them, you're not drinking enough red wine. This is the problem. <laughs> Go home, drink more red wine. Come back next week. I am sure you'll be feeling better. <laughs> so you know, red wine is the, all alcohol, very uh, potent promoter of oxidative stress, a root cause of mental health conditions that we are trying to avoid by improving our diet. Uh, so that doesn't make any sense at all. Um, how well does it energize the brain? It's simply too high in carbohydrate of all types, refined and otherwise, for the majority of us who now have insulin resistance. And those of you wearing a glucose monitor can, can check this out for yourself. A lot of people think of a nice big bowl of oatmeal topped with blueberries as brain healthy. Watch your glucose monitor when you have that, uh, that, that for breakfast and see what happens. So uh, unfortunately, the, the Mediterranean diet, while it is nutritionally better, uh, higher quality, uh, and healthier than the standard American diet, pays almost no attention to metabolic quality. Uh, so when I'm recommending a place to begin for the, you know, somebody who's trying to improve their diet, I, I recommend starting with a paleo diet instead of a Mediterranean diet, because it, 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 it includes animal foods, as does the Mediterranean diet. The Mediterranean diet does include animal foods. It's not a quote-unquote, plant-based diet. Uh, but the, the paleo diet explicitly excludes grains and legumes. It also explicitly excludes all refined carbohydrates, uh, refined seed oils, ultra-processed foods, and dairy, but we won't talk about that today. Um, and, uh, and, but, but what about energizing the brain? The paleo diet may energize your brain beautifully if you have a healthy carbohydrate metabolism. If you're lucky enough to still have that, you might be able to tolerate you know, all the fruits and starchy vegetables you wish. I mean, we were designed to do that as human beings. But if you have insulin resistance, it may uh, contain too much carbohydrate, even from fruits and vegetables, for, for you to be healthy. Only you can figure that out. So um, you may need to lower your carbohydrate intake. Uh, you may need even to, uh, to uh, go to a ketogenic diet. So on a ketogenic diet, so let's say, let's say you have insulin resistance and it's severe enough that a paleo diet is not good enough for you. Um, your brain glucose levels are still going to be spiking too high after you eat carbohydrate-rich meals, uh, your, um, and, and your, your brain insulin is going to be too low, so your brain glucose is going to, uh, processing is going to be sluggish. So you're going to need to go on a ketogenic diet to get some ketones uh, rising in the blood, 
which will cross easily over the, uh, through the blood-brain barrier and, and bridge that energy gap. You know, take up the slack that's been, um, uh, the, uh, that's been left by insulin resistance. So it's a wonderful, uh, a really uh, a godsend for the insulin resistant, insulin deficient brain. But if you're eating a ketogenic diet, please also be mindful of nutritional quality. Ketones are not all the brain needs. The brain also needs nutrients and it needs to be protected. So both metabolic and nutritional quality matter. So I wrote this book to help explain many of these very controversial things that I'm recommending and, and, and others. Um, I didn't write this book to try to control what people eat. I'm, I'm nutritionally pro-choice. Um, I work with lots of people who eat uh, so-called plant-based diets. I mean, I will help people optimize the brain health of any diet they choose. I want everyone to have a seat at the table when it comes to improving brain health. There are lots of things you can do with your diet that will improve its brain healthiness, uh, even without uh, including animal foods or going uh, on a ketogenic diet. Um, but the reason I wrote this book is because it really breaks my heart to meet people every day. They have tried so many medications. They have tried so many diets. They have tried meditation, they have tried mindfulness, they have tried psycho they've been in psychotherapy for 10 years, and they think they've tried everything, and they think they're doing everything right. The problem is they don't have the right information about food. And the reason why we don't have the right information about food is because, as Nina Teicholz and Gary Taubes and so many other people have told you, the science, uh, the science is, is, is wrong. Uh, there, the, the, there is no science behind the nutrition guidelines and headlines, most of what we see. Uh, so people have the wrong information. And so what I want people to know is that you haven't tried everything. There's so much more you can do if you have the right information. And then it's your choice to decide whether or not you want to do that. So I just want to uh, tell people out there, if they're listening and are struggling with these issues and think that there's nothing else left to try, that hope is still on the menu. Thank you.